Awesome. Good morning, church. How we doing? Doing good. It's a joy to be back uh, with you all. Um, I enjoy every chance uh, to come and to just be part and to share uh, at Numa Church. It's a joy to have my wife Astrid with us uh, this morning. So if we can say hi, Astrid. There we go. That's pretty good. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's a joy to be able to share. Uh, uh, we love Pastors Nick and Sarah, and we love you guys. And so uh, it's a joy to come uh, to share from the Word. Uh, and I'm excited to join in with you guys as you're in a sermon series called The Psalm of the Psalms of Ascent. Uh, and so I'm excited to join in as we look at Psalm 125 today. Um, uh, it's uh, one of my, my per personal things I love. I love when I visit a church. Um, and they're like, hey, could you come share? Yes, I'd love to come share. And they give me a portion of scripture to preach on. I love it because then I get to dive into a text that I'm, it's just the discovery and exploration. And then I get really excited and then I get to come and share with you all. So it's a privilege and a joy to be able to share from the word today. Um, so let's dive on in. Uh, if you have your Bible, I'd encourage you to turn to Psalm 125. Uh, if you have your phone, do that as well. It's good to kind of have that in front of us as we go. Uh, what I want to do uh, is we're going to read the text, uh, and then we're just going to walk through and see what God wants to speak to us today uh, in, a in a message called Secure in the Shaking. Secure in the Shaking in the shaking as we look at Psalm 125. I'm going to be reading from the uh, English Standard Version, uh, and so if your, tra your translation is slightly different, that's okay. Um, but let's dive on in. If you're ready, just say, I'm ready. ready. Hey, that's pretty good. That's a, a majority, so let's go for it together. So Psalm 125, only five verses. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. Uh, this is an amazing uh, text, and I'm excited for us to dive into it together. Uh, I just want to pray quickly again as we, as we go forth. God, we thank you for the reading of your word. We thank you that you've given us your word, that we might know you, that we might know uh, ourselves. We might know how to live and how to follow you. So Holy Spirit, we pray that you would uh, illuminate your inspired words to our hearts uh, that you would transform us, uh, that you would conform us, uh, and God, that we would uh, each here today hear from you, and God, that you would guide and lead us in our lives, and we love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, as I was preparing, uh, I was thinking about something because I work at a school, and so maybe you don't work at a school and you're not at school currently, uh, but maybe can you remember uh, earthquake drills? Does anybody? Again, if you grew up in the mainland, uh, that's something that we do. That's entertaining because people in many parts of the world don't do earthquake drills. That's not, a, that's not a concern for them. So again, maybe I should back up a little bit. If you're not aware, uh, we live uh, near some tectonic plates and there's the possibility of earthquakes. Uh, for schools, what they do to help prepare kids uh, is they practice. They have a drill. And at our school, I love it. Uh, we know when the earthquake drill is coming as staff, but the kids don't know when it's coming. Because guess what? Uh, none of us know when an earthquake might come. But at our school, when it's time to practice the earthquake drill and early in the year, they'll warn the little kids so they're not like freaking out, but they want to practice. And they literally play a rumbling earthquake sound 
over the PA system. And then it's time, they've trained the kids, they've prepared them. And so if you haven't done an earthquake drill, they train you, what do you do if the earth starts shaking? What's the next step? And so we train students to find something strong, to find like a table, and we encourage people to like go under, to cover your neck, protect, I might not be on camera, so for those watching at home, I apologize. I'm hiding, practicing for an earthquake under the table. But you hide under something or you find something strong. You maybe go towards a wall, maybe a door jam, maybe there's a large piece of furniture, but that's what we practice. And then in an earthquake drill, you do. And it's interesting because in an earthquake, I've never experienced an earthquake. Have any of you felt some of the minor ones that we've had? I always, I never feel them. Now, I have a hand tremor, so I'm used to kind of a base level of shaking in my body. <laughs> so maybe that's why I've never felt them yet. I just put that together right now. Um, that's probably why. But I've never felt that. But here's the thing. If this, if we had an earthquake right now, we would have to make a decision of what we trust. Right? We'd have to make a decision of what's going to provide safety for us. Uh, now, I'm lucky. I've got like, a, well, I don't know if this would hold anything, but um, <laughs> I was just watching a clip of a pastor with a very similar table. He leaned on it, and the whole top just ripped off. Anyway, um, but we'd have to make decisions. What do we trust to protect us if everything starts shaking? Uh, are we going to go near the wall? We're going to just try to sprint out, which they don't recommend um, to, for you to do. But we got to find something strong. Maybe you're just going to hold on to your spouse or maybe someone's going to dive over top of you. But in the shaking, we discover what we really trust. And now in life, we sometimes discover shaking. And I'm not talking about earthquakes. We often enter into seasons where we, are, we experience confusion, disorientation, things where we feel that are unsettled in our lives. And we walk into those moments, we will discover what we truly trust. In seasons of shaking, we will always go to what we trust. The question for us is what or who do we trust? It's often in those shaking seasons that we actually discover what we trust in. And so as we think about Psalms of Ascent, we, we, we think about this idea, and you've been going over it for the last few weeks. I've had a chance to listen to a few of the messages. Uh, but what they would have done, it's different festivals, three of them throughout the year. Uh, God's people would have uh, made a journey towards Jerusalem, eventually to the temple. There was these stairs. And as they were walking towards Jerusalem, a restored Jerusalem, they would be singing these Psalms out loud. And so they would be singing these as they think about God, as they, they move towards the temple, towards uh, the Lord. But what's interesting about the psalm is of ascent, which is about going to the Lord, right? It's this, it's this journey upwards. Uh, but when they did that, it wasn't just about where they were going. While they were going, they were also thinking about where they had come from. And so as they journeyed toward Jerusalem, as they walked from out of the city into the city, they would have walked by walls that at one point were completely destroyed. They would have walked by villages that would have been taken over by foreign powers. They would have walked by all sorts of things. And as they would have, they would have thought back to exile. They would have thought back to when the, God's people were in Babylon, when they didn't have the ability to go to Jerusalem. They didn't have the ability to walk up those steps because they were captive somewhere else. And so these Psalms of Ascent, again, not just about where we're going, but where God's people had come from. And we can even see that in our text. It's part of the context of these Psalms of Ascent. One pastor says this, a glance through the surrounding pages to see the same superscript is repeated, which is, again, on all of these psalms, Psalm 124, all the way to Psalm 130-something, I can't remember the, but again, it says, a song of ascents. In fact, Psalm 120 to 134, there's the answer, are all introduced, a song of ascents. Understood in its context, this refers to Israel's coming up out of Babylonian captivity. As each psalm shows us a little more, we begin to see the journey from exile to Jerusalem. So part of the context of this text is this idea of exile, and we can see it in verse 3 and 4, 
where it says, For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. God's people at this time would have known what it was like for the scepter of wickedness, the, the power of a foreign nation to have come in and conquered Jerusalem. They would have known that experience. They'd felt it before. As we keep going on in the text, again, it says, Do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. What is that? That's exile. God's people who struggled, like you and I, to trust the Lord. They, they, they often struggled with, with foreign gods, uh, with injustice, all of these things that would happen. And God, he was slow and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. But eventually he said to his people, you, 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 you've, you haven't held up your side of this covenant. And God allowed them to be dominated by Babylon and many of them taken away into exile, into captivity. That's this leading away. They had turned aside to their own way and God led them out in exile. And this theme of exile we see throughout scripture. Do you remember Adam and Eve? They were in the garden walking with God. And they decided to determine what was good and evil. They wanted to be the ones that would decide this is the way to go. And they chose sin. And what did God do? God sent them out of the garden. That's called exile. Guess where they also ended up? Babylon. So we think about this idea of Babylon. We can see it throughout scripture. And exile would be a time of shaking. Imagine you having your own culture, being with your people. Um, just imagine this for a moment, that if a foreign nation, let's just say Mexico, I don't know. Just imagine if Mexico, Mexico came and took over Canada, and then they kidnapped all of us and brought us to Mexico. That would be a difficult circumstance. That's what's happened in the context. That would be very disorienting. All of the things that you're familiar with, your home, your community, your people, your culture, your language, your heritage, your religion, all of these things have now been removed from you as you enter into exile. This is a disorienting time that God's people went through, a confusing time that they would go through. And here's the thing is we know the feeling. If you're a believer today that I think you experience, and I actually think it's the human experience, that in some ways we experience what it means to be in exile. That we know that there, it, we, we long for our home. That we, I love that we talked about our identity this morning, that you, we are priests, the royal priests, all that kind of holy nation. Is that we are citizens. If you have accepted Jesus, your citizenship has been transferred you are now a citizen of heaven. And as part of that is we long for our future home. We long for an abiding relationship in God's very presence. Now we can experience it today, but we recognize that there is something we look forward to. We experience a piece of exile. It says this in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage against your soul. So we experience in some way this exile. We live in this different culture. We are, we are those of a kingdom, God's kingdom, with its own values, with its own things. And, but we live in a totally different culture. We experience this idea of exile. Uh, one uh, uh, um, guy is a doctor, scholar, that kind of stuff. He says this, Tim Mackey, this is really important. In the Hebrew scriptures, Israel's Babylonian exile became an image of something more universal. It's that feeling of alienation and longing for something more, no matter where you live. That is those of us who are experiencing exile today, it is a season of shaking. The word Babylon itself means confusion. 
And we can sometimes experience that confusion in our culture, in our world that sometimes, if I'm honest with you, just doesn't make sense. If you watch the news, or if you're in my case, you scroll through, twi scroll through Twitter, you hear some of the things our culture is doing, some of the things that it believes, and you're just like, what? It just doesn't make any sense. It's very confusing when you are from another culture, but you live in this other world, and it can sometimes be disorienting. What's true? What do we do about this? Wh who am I? All of these kind of things. And so for those who are in exile, there's a big question. The question is, what do you trust? What do you trust? One of the reasons why God's people ended up in exile is because they were trusting in other things. And so what happens is when they were removed from all of those things that brought them identity and security, what would have eventually happened is that what would hopefully happen for them, and I believe God's intention, is that they would come back to the idea of who do I really trust? I trust in the Lord. We can see in the story of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you know those stories? Those guys were in the exile, Babylonian. Now, some of us are thinking Veggie Tales, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Benny. Maybe that's what you're thinking of. But they knew what it was to be in exile. A culture that said, when the music plays, bow down to this idol. If you th take a moment to think, our culture has some of those things. They say, when we play this music... When we say these things, you need to say this. You need to wear this. You need to repeat these things. This is the culture we live in. We are in Babylon. We are in an interesting time. But when we're in these times, we have to ask, who do we trust? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when the music started to play, even though they already had Babylonian names, even though they were wearing some of the culture, the, co the clothing of the culture, they're okay, I can do that. But they could not bow to the music. They couldn't bow down to that idol. They recognized that they were from a different culture and they were going to trust the Lord over and above the culture. They were going to trust the Lord to protect them because they knew that if they didn't bow, they were going to get tossed into a fiery furnace. And they were. But there was a fourth in the fire, another one with them, and they were protected and God was with them. We're going to think about this idea of who do we trust and that's what our text is really thinking about today. In these seasons of shaking, in these exile moments, in these Babylonian moments that we can have experienced today, seasons of confusion, disorientation, who do you trust? It says this in verse 1, Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. This idea of trust is central for us to know what this text is. The word trust can mean this idea of confidence or taking refuge in. Where is our confidence? Where is our faith? Where is our hope? Because there's a promise here in this text. If we trust in the Lord, we won't be moved. That word here where it says cannot be moved in other translations says cannot be shaken. It's kind of, an, it's Hebrew, so it's a word picture. It's this idea of can't be moved, can't be shaken. The promise is if we trust in the Lord, we will not be moved. But I think it's important is it's not just about our ability to trust. It doesn't says those who trust will be unmovable, but those who trust in the Lord. What's important for us as we think about trust, as we think about this verse, is that we need to think about who, what is the object of our trust. Who are we trusting in? It's those who trust in the Lord that are immovable. So we got to think about this. What, what does it mean to trust the Lord? Uh, there's one uh, author, he says this, he recently just passed away, Tim Keller. It says, it's not the strength of your faith, which can be synonymous with the word trust. I actually use those ones interchangeably. I think it's relevant. It's not the strength of your faith, but the object of your faith that actually saves you. Strong faith in a weak branch is to fatally inferior to weak faith in a strong branch. 
We need to know where are we placing our trust? What is the object of our faith? We can we, we know that we can be immovable, not be based on our trust, but based on what our trust is in. And our trust is in God. We already mentioned one of the aspects of God is that God is our rock. I love, uh, Daryl, whenever you share a word, it always, <laughs> it always connects to the message in beautiful ways. You mentioned, the, uh, you already read earlier that we won't be shaken if we trust in the Lord. You mentioned earlier that those who trust in the Lord will be like a tree with really strong roots. If a tree has wrong, strong roots, guess what? It can't be blown over either. It's stable, it's strong. But what are we building our strength on? It says this in Psalm 18. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. We need to know this, that when we trust in God, we trust in a God who is strong. We trust in a God who is the rock of our salvation. That we know that when we trust in the Lord, we trust in the one who is able to protect, that is able to save. We also know about God that we can trust in him and he's our firm foundation, that we can be immovable because God is unchanging. It says in Hebrews 13, chapter 8, a favorite verse for Foursquare Churches, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change. It also says in Malachi 3.6, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. We can put our faith in a God who doesn't change. That means he's not, he's not one way uh, yesterday and a different way tomorrow. He is the same. He's someone that we can actually build our lives on, not only because he is strong, but because he is faithful. He doesn't change. He's the same God yesterday. We can depend upon him. This is good news. We can actually build our lives upon him because he doesn't change. One more thing that is unshakable is God's love for you. One thing that is unshakable is God's love for you. It says this in Isaiah 54. Though the mountains be shaken, but though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion upon you. Did you know that God's love for you is unshakable? He loves you even when you mess up. He loves you even when you go your own way and you end up in Babylon. He still loves you. He loves you when you wake up in the morning and you've got morning breath. He loves you uh, all the time. He loves you. His love for you is unshakable. This is the God we serve. He loves you. No matter what confusion you're feeling, no matter the shaky season you might be in, know this, God's love is unshakable. But here's the good news. As we put our trust in him, it says that those who trust in the Lord cannot be moved, cannot be shaken. Why? Because we put our trust in the one who will not be moved, the God who does not change. We can be steady like mountains because God is the rock of our salvation. So the question is, is will we trust God? There's a promise. There's an invitation. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, who cannot be moved but abides forever. This is good news, that even though we live in Babylon, the shifting world that we live in, we can be steady in it because we trust in God. So will we trust in God? There's a couple things I want to think about is will we trust God? First, will we trust his statutes? Someone say statutes. I just, so just random note this morning, uh, much like Sesame Street, this message is brought to you by the letter S. Um, and so there's security, uh, secure in the shaking. All my points are now going to be start with the letter S because it helps my brain. I love alliteration. But as we think about his statues, will we trust his statues? Here's the question. Will we trust his word? Will we trust his instructions for us? 
This is an important question. This was the question back in the garden. Will, we, will they trust what God says is good and evil? This is the question of our text in, in verse 3 and 4. This idea of do good. Or are we going to turn to walk in our own ways? Are we going to walk in God's ways? Or are we going to choose to walk in our own ways? That is the question, is who do we trust? There's a verse in Proverbs that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. We do as those who trust in the Lord need to learn to trust in Him. And one of the ways we trust in Him is we trust His ways. We trust His word. We trust His standards. We trust His statutes. We trust that those are the way that we should walk in. Here's the thing. What happens when we don't? What happens when we decide, you know what, God, I know you think this on this topic, but I actually want to go this way. What happens is we end up in our own Babylon. But those who turn aside to their crooked ways, when you choose to turn your own way, it says the Lord will lead you away with evildoers, exile. That's the result when we choose as individuals to walk in our own way. If you might be feeling now a lot of confusion in your life, disorientation, maybe you should ask the question, have I chose to walk my own way? to live by my own standards, to trust myself above what the Lord would speak or maybe trust the culture above what God, God's word would say. This is one of the biggest issues of our day. This question of who will determine what is good? Who will determine what is evil? We live in a culture that has all sorts of ideas. Uh, again, all sorts of ideas of, of what is right, of what is wrong. And you can even start thinking in your mind right now some of the messages of our culture of what is good, of what is wrong. And whenever we stray away from God's standards, it will always lead to exile, always lead to confusion. We live in a very confused world, a very confused time. That even basic reality, our culture says the opposite is true. We have young people at unprecedented rates living in anxiety and confusion because they've been lied to. They've been told things that are so far against God's ways. No wonder they're feeling anxious. No wonder for they're feeling disoriented. They're not even sure of who God's made them to be in their own bodies. They're confused to the core of who they are. And that's what happens in Babylon when we walk away from God's standards. There's a fantastic book. It's called Strange New World that kind of helps us understand our culture. Because I'm going to be honest with you, our world is a lot like Babylon. It's strange. It's a bit of a three-ring circus, if we're honest. And so the idea of this book that helps us understand our culture is our culture believes this. Our culture believes that what is true is what I feel on the inside. So the standard isn't God's word. The standard is an object reality. The standard is for what's true is what I feel on the inside. Our culture then believes what I feel on the inside should be expressed, always should be expressed. I should be authentic to me. Everything I feel, I should communicate and express. The third thing our culture believes is that whatever we express externally should be celebrated by others. We're living in Babylon. Your feelings are not facts. Your feelings are very important. God's given you those feelings. But the things we feel on the inside aren't true all the time. We are easily deceived. We're easily confused, and we live in a time and a culture that is very confused. We live in Babylon. And so part of the reality is this, is who are we going to decide is what's true, what's good, what's evil? But we also have to think about the question is, does God satisfy? That's the next S. So will we trust his statutes? And part of trusting his statutes, will we believe that when we follow his ways, will he satisfy? I want to encourage us in this is that we must learn to believe, and I think we can experience this today, that when we trust God, we need to also trust that His ways lead to our flourishing. They lead to our good. Even though sometimes we might on the inside disagree with it, I'm going to trust the Lord. That when I walk in His patterns, when I walk in His ways, it's actually going to lead to my benefit. Now, good news, this is just reality. 
When we walk in God's ways, not only do we know it's true because God's word says it's true, and we, but we can experience it. It's even studied by psychologists. When people choose to walk in God's ways, how God has defined marriage, how God has defined humans who we are, the outcomes are better. Your mental health is better. Your physical health will be better as we trust in the Lord and trust in his ways. That not only is it true because God said it, but it actually results in my, I'm satisfied. It results in my own flourishing when I choose to trust in God's ways. Not going in my own ways, but trusting in the Lord. We can be secure when we trust in the truth of God, that we won't be shaken, won't be moved, because we can walk in his ways that lead stability and strength in our lives. The next S when it comes to will we trust God is will we trust God for our security? Will we trust God for our security? Uh, It says this in verse two, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time and forevermore. Now, here's the thing. When we say mountains in BC, what do we think about? We think about the mountains, right? Big mountains, often covered in snow, lots of trees. You can go skiing on them. One thing that I think is helpful as we think about Jerusalem, we think about Mount Zion, which is often synonymous with Jerusalem in Scripture. They're just kind of used interchangeably, although there is Mount Zion. Although the location has changed three times, but that's beside the point. We can talk about that after church. But... This idea, we actually want to show you a picture of what these mountains look like. So here is a picture of Jerusalem. You can see the gold dome. That's the Temple Mount. So back in the day when the temple was there before it was destroyed, I think about 70 AD, um, that's where the temple would have been, where they would have walked these very steps and they would have been singing these very songs. And that itself is a bit of a hill. But if you look around, there's these kind of, well, I call them hills because I'm from BC. And so we see, but there are all these mountains, they all have different names that surround Jerusalem. This is a picture of security. That if you live in a a place, obviously there's walls, but if you live in a place, there's these natural barriers of defense. And so when they would have walked in, that's the picture. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, this idea of security, of protection, so the Lord surrounds his people. One of our questions that we have to ask for ourselves is, do we trust that we are secure in God, that our protection is found from him? Will we trust in God for our security? Will we trust in him to keep us safe? Uh, Some of those things that uh, we trust, uh, again, when, when it comes to our own security, what we're leaning in to protect us. There's some good things that we lean on to protect us. Uh, Security systems, I guess. I don't know if you have a guard dog, but no. But like some things that we trust to keep us secure, maybe wise financial decisions, uh, maybe actual fortification. Those things are good, but what can happen is those things can actually take a place above God. That we trust those things more than him and those things can ultimately become idols in our lives. That's one of the things that happened, why God's people were brought out of, uh, out of their promised land into Babylonian exiles because they were trusting other things to keep them safe. They were trusting other idols, trusting other gods to protect them, to maybe make their crops grow. All these things, they were trusting in other things above God. Maybe they were even trusting their own moral goodness. They said, hey, if I can live and follow all God's things, then I'll be safe. That's a good thing, but that's not your ultimate source of security. They might even think, we've got all these religious systems. We've got the temple. We've got these systems in place. But here's the thing. We don't trust those things above God to protect us. Those are good things. But if we put those things above the Lord, they become idols. And what happens to God's people when they worship idols? They end up in Babylon. And we have our own idols today. Things that we trust more than God. Maybe it's your bank account or your RRSPs. I sometimes think it's this, when it comes to our own security, we often might say the phrase, everything will go bad, but at least I have fill in the blank. That might be a place that you're trusting for your security, maybe even above God, but at least I have this. The hope is the answer should be, things might be going crazy, things might be shaking, but God is my protector. 
But what we often do is we lean into our own things. We, you know, at least my bank account's solid and my RSP, RSP is growing. Maybe where you put your trust is in your own health. Everything's falling apart, but I'm strong as an ox. Maybe it's in your own intelligence. But everything's falling apart, but I'm just smarter than everybody else. Whatever it might be. Those things are good, right? I encourage you, save some money. Pursue your health. Those are good things, but they're not the ultimate place for our security because all of those things could be removed in a moment. They, they're shaky things. What's immovable is God, that he surrounds his people, that he is our ultimate hope and our protection. So what do we trust for our security? We need to become those who learn to trust in him because when we trust in him, God himself surrounds us and is our source of security. And not only for today, but also forevermore, right? That's what it says in the text. The Lord surrounds his people from this time, but also forevermore. The second thinking about salvation. That's the last S we're going to look at. What are we trusting to save us? Where is our hope for our salvation? What about our forever security? Uh, what will we trust in the Lord? Will we trust in God or will we trust in ourselves? Will we trust in the gospel or will we try to trust in our own moral record? Here's the thing. We need to learn to trust in God. He's the only solid foundation, the, 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 the unshakable place to put our hope for salvation. Romans 10, 9 says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that's the gospel. That's what Christ has done for us. He's come to live a perfect life, to die, to, to, to live a sinless life, to die in our place, to pay the price for our sins, right? And so when we trust in him, we thought Daryl reminded us of this this morning. It says that this, that you will be saved. My confidence isn't in my own record. It isn't in who, if I think I've done the right things. It's my confidence needs to be the gospel. The part of trusting God is trusting him completely for your salvation. Entirely. That it's what Jesus has done that saves me not what I've done. I'm just going to receive it through faith, what Christ has done for me. That here's the thing, we often try to trust ourselves. We think I'm going to be saved. Well, because at least I'm not as bad as that guy. Do you know what my neighbor has done? He, he waters his lawn when there is a water restriction. My neighbor does this. Or we might think at least I'm not Hitler, <laughs> right? We make all of these equations. I'll be saved because I'm not as bad as that guy. That's not where our salvation is found. Our salvation is found in the perfect one, Jesus Christ. Or we might think that, and this is what we hear a lot in the world, I'll be saved, I'm good for, I'm going to heaven because my good things outweigh my bad things, right? This is, we find this all the time. Guess what God calls our good things? Filthy rags before him. It's, this isn't a cosmic balance that if we can get it right, because guess what? Humans, if that was the scale, all of us, it's, the, the bad's going to outweigh. It's just what it is. So we have to trust alone in Jesus for our salvation, completely trusting in him. And guess what? He's a secure place that we can trust in him because his work is finished. The grave is empty. He has risen indeed. So we can trust in salvation, the blood of Jesus, because it's what has saved us and the only thing that can save us. The only secure, unshakable place to put the security of our souls is in the spotless lamb, our suffering savior, the son of God, Jesus Christ. I want to encourage us as we close. You can be secure, steady, and immovable in the shaking around you. We're in Babylon, and it's confusing, and sometimes we're tempted to believe the things the culture believes. Sometimes we're tempted to, to change how we live, all those things. You don't have to. You don't have to be shaking. You don't have to be moved. Why? When we put our trust in the rock. We put our trust in the strong God of our salvation. You don't have to be moving. You can know what it is to have confidence in this world, in this life that people don't even understand. How are you making it through the shaking season? I'm just trusting the Lord. Now, sometimes it's hard. Exile isn't easy. I'm not saying this is an easy proposition, but I am saying that you don't have to be shaken in the shaking seasons. 
You don't have to be shaken in the shaken season. You might feel disoriented and lost, but you can trust Jesus and encounter the stability that he can bring to your life. You can know the protection and peace because he surrounds you. Did you know that he surrounds you? Just like the, the hills, the mountains of Jerusalem surround, he surrounds you. It says this in Psalm 139, my favorite Psalm. Maybe I'll come back and preach it another time. Oh Lord, I'm going to read a few verses, but oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and you are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, oh Lord, you know it all together. Now catch this. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. God surrounds you. He goes before you. He's behind you. He hems you in. I love that. It's like you're a pillowcase and he puts you in and he's not, he, you're secure. He covers you. You are surrounded by God. Christ is more than just a weighted blanket. He is our strong protector, firm foundation, fortress, strength, and shield. As I close today, I just want to read a portion of a poem from St. Patrick. We were thinking about Irish people. We're going to finish with an Irish guy, but I'm not going to do the accent. It says this, Christ with me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down. Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me. Christ in the, man, in the heart, mouth of every man who speaks of me. Christ in the eye that sees me. Christ in the ear that hears me. Let's pray. God, I thank you that we can trust in you because of who you are. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the great I am, the unchanging one. You are the rock of our salvation. And so, God, we thank you that we can trust in you. You don't change, and that's a good thing for us. Because in a world that is constantly changing, constantly shifting, constantly shaking, you never do. You're our anchor. You're our firm foundation. You're the reference point, and you're the place that we can run to. And so, God, I pray for each and every one of us here today that we would learn to increasing ways to fully trust in you. Holy Spirit, would you search our hearts and find the, the things that we trust more than you? And God, that we would turn to realize that you, those things are shaky ground. Lord God, that my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. God, we pray that we will learn to trust in you in increasing measure, and that as we do, we would encounter the security, the stability that it is to trust you, to walk in your ways, and to trust you for our protection, not only now, but for eternity. Lord, I pray for those that have never trusted in you, God, that today they would. They would realize they've been trying to trust in things that won't save them, things that are subject to change, things that are shaky, things that are unsecure. And God, what they would do today is they would wholly lean upon you and your work, Jesus, upon the cross. And God, that as we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts, we will be saved. So God, I thank you that you protect us and that you surround us, that we are secure in you. We can breathe deep in a changing Babylon because we know the great I am. Not only is he with us and for us, but he surrounds us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.